Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you who noticed, no, the lessons were not wrong this morning. That was exactly what we had wanted to do and had planned for. And you probably better get used to it. For those who don't pay attention to the lessons, or weren't paying attention today, just specifically because you normally do, right? Um, There were some glaring changes today. Today, there is no Old Testament reading or New Testament reading, like usually the reading from Paul, the second lesson. Today, there is only one psalm, like we normally do, and the reading from the gospel, and a particular gospel. Why? Well, brace yourself. This morning, we are going to talk about Matthew. Now, my brother's name is Matthew, but we're not going to talk about him. Today, we are going to talk about the gospel named Matthew. And actually, we're going to talk about the gospel named Matthew a lot, like for 51 more weeks after today. For those of you who are particularly big church dorks like me, you know that we read a collection of Bible readings over a three-year cycle. For example, if you were here three years ago on this day, this first Sunday in Advent, you would have gotten a set of readings that should have been in your bulletin for today. And then three years into the future, those same readings would pop back up again. Most Lutheran, Catholic, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Methodist, and many other churches all follow this three-year cycle together. Which is sort of cool, because if you go to another Catholic or Lutheran or Protestant or whatever kind of church um, somewhere else today, you'd get the same readings that we would have gotten or any other place on this day. And so within that cycle, each of the three years is sort of centralized on one gospel. One year, Mark gets most of the gospel readings, another year, Luke, another year, Matthew. And unfortunately for John, he just kind of gets sort of spread throughout all three years, doesn't get a year of his own. Um, Technically speaking, today is the first Sunday of year A, and year A is the Matthew year. So... This year, for year A, we will indeed be getting a little bit of Matthew. In fact, a lot of Matthew. In fact, we will be reading every single word of Matthew straight through. Because of our commitment to Matthew, we decided to drop the other two readings because we wanted you to focus on that reading from Matthew. And not because the other two aren't important, because they are. Um, But the goal for this year is to deeply get entrenched in this story of Matthew. I hope that you'll hear the uniqueness of Matthew's voice for God's story and Jesus. I hope that you will actually focus and know the story of Jesus as Matthew tells it, and as it's different from Luke and Mark especially. To be honest, I found that many people don't really pay attention to the Bible readings on a given Sunday. I know this may be shocking to some of you. I know probably everybody here pays attention, and you'd say, Oh, I pay attention. How dare you say such a thing? Fair enough. Fair enough, but keep in mind, my seat in worship faces all of you. Even if you sit back in the balcony and talk most of the way through the sermon like you in the choir, I can see the looks on your faces. I see the fidgeting with knickknacks, the playing with the children in front of you, the yawning. You get the drift. I see your level of focus and interest, and I can say that, despite what you say, there are many people who are zoning out during those Bible readings. So each of these Sundays for the next year, we'll have a scheduled psalm just like this morning and a reading from Matthew. Sometimes the readings from Matthew are going to be really long. Sometimes they'll be really short. We will still fully live into the church year as much as possible. Like this is Advent right now that we're living into. And so whenever possible, I've really tried to time things so that the stories can go with the church year. We're going to get the birth story of Jesus on Christmas. We'll get the baptism story of Jesus on the baptism of our Lord. Works out really nicely that way. Occasionally, we'll jump out of our chronological reading of Matthew's Gospel to hear stories like the Transfiguration story on Transfiguration Sunday, or Holy Week at that time of the year. But we'll also get those stories again in chronological order. For example, next fall, we will begin to work through the Holy Week narrative from Matthew for a second time in the church year, since we'll get it during the actual Holy Week time. But on Reformation and next All Saints festivals, we'll find ourselves reading that passion narrative from Matthew. So I have to say, and I have to acknowledge you who may be frustrated or angry, and I have to apologize. I am sorry. However, I'm more than happy to equip you with the regular readings for each week so that you can read those in addition to the Matthew-centric readings that we'll be getting here in church. That way you can read everything that you wanted to read and not miss anything. 
It's just that after a lot of prayer and conversation with people here in our church community, I just feel that like this is the way that our church community can best grow in our faith at this moment in time, using Matthew in this way of teaching um, in this part of worship. And so as you've no doubt seen in your bulletin already this morning, um, there's an extra handout there that we don't normally have, and it's next week's reading. And I commend that to all of you so that you could study it, so that you could read it, and so that it gets presented here at House of Prayer meetings and small groups. I just hope that you'll pray over it so that um, you can get even more out of each week's worship and teaching time. Um, and I'd be glad, to, if you're so inclined, to give you more um, study materials than just that reading, uh, places where you can find more out about the history and the chronology and about what else is going in the text. Um, okay, so today's the first day of Matthew, and I want to tell you about Matthew. So over the next 45 minutes, we'll really be done. Okay, so it won't be 45 minutes, but I'm going to give you a little orientation to begin with. Have you ever sat in your car and messed with the speaker adjustments in the car, like the fade and the left-right business? Like, have you ever messed with those while you're listening to music? Um, Like, while you're sitting in the driver's seat, you can make all the sound come out of the back right speaker, or you can make it all come out, like, right by your ear in that front left corner. Um, Often, depending upon the music that you're listening to, you end up missing something if you turn it all to, like, the left side, or if you turn it all to the right side, you'll miss some of the instruments that are as part of that music. Um, And so it's really important to have everything balanced and even in your car. And so it is with the Gospels. You need to be listening to all four Gospels to get this idea of what Jesus is all about. When you turn up one speaker really loud, you'll get one sense for what the song's all about or what the story of Jesus is all about. And so it's important to have a balanced view. So I offer that as we do exactly the opposite of that. And we'll only be diving into Matthew for the next year. But I just want you to hold that tension in in your head over this next year. So if I'm going to tell you about Matthew, and some orientation on Matthew, I first need to put some historical context around Matthew. Like for, to begin with, I need to tell you that Matthew was not written by some disciple of Jesus named Matthew. And the book of Matthew wasn't written by any contemporary of Jesus. Rather, the book of Matthew was written much, much later. Um, And so for the sake of our conversations now and over the next year, I'll use the name Matthew as a designation of the book, not the person who actually wrote it. Rather, in fact, Matthew was written much later than when Jesus was alive. If Jesus was born about 3 or 4 AD, most would argue that he died about 30 to 35 AD. Um, And so Matthew and his gospel was composed somewhere around 85 AD a good at least generation or two, um, 50-some years after Jesus was born and raised. And really, if we were put to, to put the books and the stories of the New Testament in some sort of chronological order, after Jesus died, we would have the works of Paul. And Paul comes about 15, 10, 15 years after Jesus and lived to be about to about 60 AD, so that 15-year span right then. Um, so his works, you know, the Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and books attributed to Paul, all come in that time period right after Jesus was born for about 15 years and 15 years after that. And it isn't until 70 AD um, when we have any of the four Gospels written. And most scholars would argue that Mark was the first one written. And that Mark was written down because things were getting really bad for followers of Jesus. And they figured they should write down their stories before they all get killed by the Romans who were after them. um, So that their stories would continue to live on. And so we have Mark as the first one written, at least most scholars would suggest. Um, and then, and his story was written from mostly oral tradition. It was kind of passed down for those 40, 50 years since Jesus was, was he lived and was killed. Um, and then from Mark, Matthew and Luke were written. Um, and a cool, interesting thing about the way their books were written, Matthew and Luke, is they were both written about the same time, but yet in different locations. And most scholars would argue that, that Matthew and Luke had Mark in their hands as they wrote their Gospels. And they also had this other source called the Q source that they shared. And then they also had their own bits of pieces of the story, oral tradition passed down for many um, decades until they got to their point. And so we see similarities between Matthew and Mark and Luke. And we see similarities between just Matthew and Luke that aren't in, Matthew, aren't in Mark. And then we also have things that are just unique to Matthew and things that are just unique to Luke. And so as we move through this year, we're going to find things in Matthew that are that are collaboratively held between Matthew and Luke and, and Mark, and things that are found just in Mark and Matthew, and things that are just unique to Matthew. Um, 
we won't talk much about John because John comes like 30 years after this, and it's hard to put that all into perspective. And so we won't talk much about John. Um, if you want to disagree with all the things I'm telling you, that's fine. No one knows exactly for sure how all this happened. It's just best scholarly advice. And so um, when we get into Bible studies, and some of you who are prone to arguing like to argue, um, I'll be glad to discuss all this with you, um, but you better back up what you're going to argue. Not just, well, I didn't like it being taught like that. That won't fly. So I could say a whole lot more about all this history, this context of Matthew, um, but that's what we're going to dig into over this next year. Um, here in worship, in your private study, and in the many other times and places we gather around House of Prayer. Um, so let me use a favorite reading technique of mine to jump off, and that is starting with the end. Our reading for this morning, on this very first day of Matthew, is the reading that we'll hear next year on the last day of the church year. It's the Christ the King Sunday next year we'll hear this. And within this chapter, this 28th chapter of Matthew, we pretty much have the heart and soul of everything that Matthew is about. It begins with resurrection. Even in the resurrection story, we see the big theme of Matthew, and that is undermining cultural norms. Because who shows up at the tomb to see Jesus resurrected? Women. Jesus isn't there initially, and when he actually appears to them in verse 9, Jesus meets them and sends them off to do God's work. Matthew likes and raises up women more than the other Gospels. A second prominent theme we'll see in the Gospel of Matthew is in the next paragraph there in the reporting of the guard in verse 11. See, Matthew is very harsh on the Jewish religious authorities, those who kind of already have power. Um, and so immediately, in a story unique to Matthew in this part, he has those religious leaders bribing soldiers to lie about what actually happened to Jesus, saying that the disciples took his body. Again, Matthew does not speak highly of the Jews and their leadership, and we'll see that more in this year. But at the same time, Matthew's gospel is one in which the Jewish followers of Jesus um, are important, and, and Matthew has great hope in their leadership in the church. In fact, he's the only gospel that even speaks of the church, um, the quote church, and that lasting, continuing, living vision and version of Jesus' ministry. And not that the other gospels don't think it also, but Matthew is actually concrete about it. He actually says the word, the church. Um, and he ends his gospel with another unique to Matthew story. Um, it's these immortal words that we just we love so much here in the church, where Jesus commissions those after him to continue the work of the church. Verse 17 is cool. Amidst worship and doubt, Jesus says that all authority is his, and with that he tells them to go and make disciples, baptizing, teaching. And he promises to be with them all, always. Matthew's gospel is all about God showing up and being with us. The first way Jesus will be introduced to us in just a few weeks is by this name that Matthew uses, Emmanuel, God with us. So likewise, as Jesus sends the church out to make disciples, his final words are, Emmanuel, I am still with you, always. God with us, God with you. And so I have great anticipation for this year of Matthew with you. There's so much to say and learn, yet I think everything about this upcoming year is moving to those words that we just heard. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, chapter one next week. See you then. Amen.